Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on the Early Education and Childhood and Care Strategic Review released by ASQA. Um, my name is Bronwyn Griffiths and I'm the manager of the Strategic Review team in the Australian Skills Quality Authority. And today I'm joined by Andrea Bateman, who's a lead auditor, lead, is an auditor at ASQA and the lead writer of our strategic review. And we're also joined by Mark Shaddock, who's the Senior Skills Engagement Specialist at Skills IQ. So welcome to both Andrea and Mark and welcome to you at home or at work. Uh, today's session, we're going to provide you with an overview of our strategic review for, of training for early childhood education and care industry in Australia. ASQA uh, commissioned this review uh, in response to a systemic risk that had presented itself in this industry. ASQA has, treats two types of risk. We treat systemic risk, which is any risk likely to uh, exist across the sector or in a concerning proportion of providers. And if it's left untreated, it's a significant risk of this type can have a detrimental impact on the quality of training and assessment for individuals, industry and the wider community and also could lead to loss of confidence in the sector. Uh, obviously, ASQA also responds to individual provider risk uh, when we uh, are looking at individual providers. This one was a systemic risk, obviously, because we could see some issues affecting providers in this industry. What prompted a large, a large part of the review was prompted by an earlier report done by the Productivity Commission into early childhood development workforce, and it highlighted a number of concerning practices within the sector. So today we're going to talk to you today about the background to the review, what it found, uh, the recommendations that it made, and where we're up to in implementing those recommendations uh, going forward, uh, where, what will happen next, as well as we'll be able to finish and take some questions from those of you watching uh, through your computer. So in terms of how today's uh, session works, uh, it's interactive, so you can ask questions, which is, which is great, and you can do that by using the chat function on your screen. Uh, the panel will try to answer as many questions as possible today, and if we can't answer your questions, we'll take them on notice and we'll post up an answer on our uh, website as soon as possible after the webinar. Uh, it's important to note, uh, if you're watching uh, from an RTO, that we can't answer uh, or respond to specific questions about specific applications, audits or complaints that you might have currently being uh, assessed by ASQA, and we can't provide professional advice on um, whether resources or particular strategies would be compliant with the standards. So it's a more general uh, presentation today, but we will be happy to take your questions at the end of the session. So, kicking off, um, some background to the strategic review. Uh, okay, so the background, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had the earlier Productivity Commission report released in 2011 on early childhood development workforce. Obviously, they had a look at this given the, um, the projected workforce needs that they could see back in 2011, so they could see that that was going to be an area of uh, activity and of growing workforce needs. So when the Productivity Commission had a look into the training at that point, or the workforce development, they raised some issues about the quality of training and relating to learning and assessment. And this prompted ASQA to undertake its strategic review uh, into training for early childhood education and care in Australia. So that's how we started out. Uh, when we were undertaking the review, these were the, f the focus of what, how we went about conducting the review was obviously to really look into the issues raised by the Productivity Commission's report. Uh, as the regulator, of course, we focused on the usual uh, regulatory issues that we deal with, training and assessment, course duration, whether RTOs had strategies for effective industry consultation, the materials that RTOs were using to deliver their courses, the information RTOs were providing to learners and potential learners prior to enrolment, the support that RTOs were putting in place to support learners to complete their qualification, RTOs marketing and advertising practices, and how RTOs were transitioning students from superseded training packages. So that was the background to the focus that we brought into uh, the review. And so then we went and launched into the review and we conducted the review uh, using a number of uh, methodologies to engage with the sector. Firstly, uh, we 
uh, undertook a survey of all of the ASQA regulated RTOs that were offering the Certificate 3 or Diploma of Early Childhood and Care. Uh, we also undertook um, a number of audits, as we do. 77 audits occurred between January 2013 and April 2014. Those 77 audits were in two categories. There were 30 audits which were specifically designed and targeted for this strategic review. And then we used the audit results from 47 more general audits that ASCO had conducted um, in, in relation to a range of um, other issues. So we used those audit results to inform the review. Um, we conducted a range of research into what was happening into the sector, obviously using the Productivity Commission report. We looked at the data in terms of delivery of training by RTOs, RTO numbers, national distribution of RTOs and student numbers. And we looked into the data about provider types, numbers and uh, enrolments and graduations. So we had a look at all the data we could gather. Uh, we established a management committee and the management committee was chaired by our Chief Commissioner, Chris Robinson, and engaged a range of um, other stakeholders, including the two other regulators in Victoria and WA, the Community Services and Health Industry Skills Council, the Commonwealth Department of Education and Training, Peak Industry Associations, and ASEQA, which is the Australian Children's uh, Education and Care Quality Authority. We had a range of uh, consultation uh, with key stakeholders, including not-for-profit organisations, peak bodies, RTOs and uh, stakeholder associations. And we did that through uh, dedicated focus groups, uh, formal roundtable meetings and then uh, any opportunities that the management committee could uh, identify for us to go out and engage with um, stakeholders. So it was a wide-ranging um, engagement process, if you like, so we could get a handle on all of the issues across those very different stakeholder groups. So that's how we conducted the review, so it's quite extensive and now Andrea is going to talk us through about what uh, the findings of the review were. Thanks Andrea. Thanks Bronwyn. Uh, as you can see on your screen there were five qualifications that were audited um, for the strategic review. The first three were the certificate threes, the two certificate threes that were um, still being conducted at that time and a diploma that was in, they were in superseded mode. There were also the two current ones, which are still current today, which was the Certificate 3 and the Diploma. So these five qualifications were audited and because some were being in, um, in superseded, ASQA acknowledges that it was fairly difficult or complex to be able to audit those, those sets um, and made it complex for both the RTO and ASQA and for writing the report. So um, in terms of the findings, thank you. Um, some of the key findings, they actually confirmed the Productivities Commission concern with the quality of training and assessment. Um, and we found that uh, RTOs did struggle with complying with training package requirements. Um, the, although the compliance did increase after the rectification period, and I'll talk about that shortly. But there was excessively short training, which appeared to be closely aligned to poor and inadequate assessment. Um, there was poor learning and assessment workplace requirements, trainer and assessor industry currency and um, some inconsistent practice around RPL. But what was interesting really was that the fact that the um, course duration or the um, amount of training at the time that we were looking at, um, over three quarters, about three quarters of the Certificate 3 in childcare was delivered in about uh, 70, 750 hours or less. So if you look at the AQF requirements, um, they indicate for a Certificate 3 that the benchmark is at a minimum uh, one year, which is approximately 1,200 hours. So when you think that some are 750 or less, um, there is a very uh, short period of time where teaching and um, training is occurring. So, so I'm getting down to some more specifics on uh, the compliance findings. You'll see that some of the issues were around training and assessment specifically. Uh, that was really around assessment tools um, lacking validity. Around the access to facilities and equipment, that was around even hard um, equipment, but also the fact that um, weren't meeting the context and conditions of assessments of the units themselves. 
and that became quite an important point in the audits. In terms of course information, incorrect information just came, came through um, a range of um, providers uh, about the, the mandatory work placement was inaccurate. Um, approximately 74% of the RTOs were not compliant, but certainly after rectification that dropped down to 31% not compliant. So in the audit process, ASQA um, allows RTOs 20 working days for rectification period to address the non-compliances. And we'll talk about the findings after rectification on the next slide. So you can see there's a common theme about the rectifications. Um, we still found issues around information, currency of trainers, particularly vocational currency, assessment still not meeting the requirements, um, training materials inadequate or incomplete, uh, gain access to facilities and, and the strategies in themselves. And in the rectification period, a lot of the um, issues and the non-compliances were more around the newer qualifications, the, the new Certificate 3 and the new Diploma that were recently added to scope. So that transitioning issue there was clear in, in the three strategic, 30 strategic reviews. Um, it's important to note too, I think, in this period of time, the audits were against the 2012, thank you, standards of NVR re uh, registered training organisations. Um, and now we're under, working under the 2015 standards. So just to make it a little bit easier, we've put up on, the, on this particular slide the old 12, 2012 standards and the 2015. So you can see the relationship between the two. And, and really these are the areas of concern. You can see them on the left-hand side, training, the resources required, competency assessment, engagement. And they were the ones that were persistent um, throughout the review. So thank you, Bronwyn. Thanks, Andrea. That's really um, useful to get that detailed overview about what the audits were finding. If we now um, move on to um, the recommendations, uh, I'll take you through uh, the, the 10 recommendations that were made by the review and where we're up to in doing some implementation work around those recommendations. So uh, obviously, um, You've heard the issues that we've found in the review, so the recommendations go to uh, trying to address some of those issues. Uh, a persistent issue for um, ASQA and a concern for ASQA is uh, course duration or amount of training or volume of learning, whatever you want to call it. It's the how much training uh, and how much time is allowed for training and assessment. Um, training packages, uh, so we've made a recommendation about trying to strengthen the training packages to include some minimum benchmarks. <coughs> to ensure that RTOs are clear about what's required and to support ASQA to, to regulate those uh, times. Uh, Andrea talked to us about um, some of the length of courses we found during the childcare review. And while that's a, of concern, obviously, in this industry, it's a concern more broadly across VET. Uh, we also um, made some recommendations for ASQA itself. And one of those was that we see uh, early childhood education and care providers as being a really good source of uh, intelligence and information for ASCRA about uh, poor training um, provision. And so we're seeking to engage with uh, the, the employers in that sector to get a much better understanding of their concerns around some of the training providers. Um, we're seeking, again, to have the training packages provide additional clarity in relation to assessment evidence that RTOs are required to uh, maintain. We also um, uh, want clearer, uh, uh, greater clarity in the training packages around the adequate provision of training and assessment in actual or simulated workplaces. We're uh, recommending that RTOs need to strengthen their engagement with industry employers to strengthen workplace learning and we're also recommending that RTOs enhance their professional development for their trainers and assessors. So that's a general overview of the recommendations. If I go now to each of the recommendations um, uh, individually and we can have a talk um, about where we're up to in implementing these recommendations. I'm pleased to say action's occurring on, on each of them and so we've got um, the, the, re the report is not sitting on bookshelves gathering dust. It's actually, being, uh, it's actually a live document that we're out there working with our stakeholders to, to implement the recommendations. 
So the first implementation, the first recommendation that uh, we made was the one about the length of the course duration or the length of training. So um, uh, people would be familiar with the fact that ASQA does not set these um, requirements. They're set by industry through the training packages and then they're endorsed by the Australian Industry Skills uh, Committee. So we don't set them, but we regulate against them. So they're very important to ASQA. Uh, ASQA is concerned, as I've mentioned, about short duration courses, not just in childcare and early education, but also in um, the vet sector more broadly. Uh, so we have, um, uh, we have identified that as an ongoing concern. We've uh, announced a, a separate strategic review into course duration, and we're working with um, our stakeholders through that separate review on course duration to see what can be done to improve that. In the, in, in the interim, we continue to work with the Australian Industry Skills uh, Committee to uh, progress this recommendation. Um, so our course duration work is happening now and we expect to release a report uh, in the not too distant future about what we found more broadly on course duration and what, um, what recommendations we might make around that specifically. Uh, recommendation two uh, was to ASQA that we reach out and uh, work more closely with the um, Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority or CEQA and other relevant industry stakeholders uh, to partner with them and to seek out uh, peak bodies and employer groups in this industry um, to make sure we understand their concerns about the quality of provider training and assessment. So we've done that. We've, um, we've had a very successful roundtable that was uh, co-hosted between ASCA and ASEQA earlier this year. We had 16 uh, large employer representative bodies at the roundtable and we talked about a range of issues with them. We talked to them about um, their confidence in reporting their concerns to ASQA. We established uh, a new mechanism for them to do that so that they can have confidence that their concerns are treated appropriately and they get some feedback about what's happened. Um, ASQA has a dedicated uh, industry engagement team, uh, which its role is to reach out to industry and to um, gather intelligence and understand industry's concerns. So industry engagement is working closely with the CEQA to make sure their concerns are brought forward through the ASQA processes. Uh, we are going to have a second um, roundtable with the CEQA before the end of the year and bring that group back together to hear how that's, um, how that's working and whether there's any new concerns. We also took the opportunity to talk to them about a range of other issues, uh, especially around um, the need for employer groups to support RTOs with work placements, but we'll come back to that one in a bit more detail uh, in relation to a different recommendation. Okay, so recommendation three is um, going to the issue about how we could talk to the sector about what we found in our review and um, develop some systemic communications to explain uh, and make sure RTOs who are in this sector understand the issues and understand some of the concerns we had uh, when we did the audits and the other research work for the review. So today's webinar, and we had a webinar yesterday, um, is what we hope is an innovative and a flexible way to reach out to RTOs to give them the opportunity to hear directly from us about the review um, and to ask some questions about it. So we're doing that. Obviously, uh, there's other means of communication ASQA publishes a range of um, fact sheets that go to some of the issues that were raised during the review around professional development and other matters. So uh, a bit of a shout out for ASQA's um, fact sheets. They're available on our website and they're pretty useful. Uh, we're always interested in feedback on the, on the fact sheets and whether there's um, other fact sheets that we could develop that could help RTO. So I'd encourage people out there to um, also have a look at those fact sheets on the ASQA website. Okay, so the next recommendation, recommendation four, again was to ASQA. And it went to the fact that due to the level of concerning issues that we found during the strategic review, that we would have a, a follow-up strategic audit, if you like, on the two new qualifications uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, so that's been a bit of an evolving um, consideration of how we should best go about doing that. So our implementation strategies is slightly different. So what we are doing 
is that we continue through our environmental scans, which we conduct um, twice a year, we continue to see um, a large level of concern around these products in terms of complaints and in terms of compliance uh, outcomes at audit. So that, that makes them a product of concern in our ASCO language, which means when we are out auditing for any other reason, we always, if these qualifications are on the RTO's uh, scope, then they're always included in that audit. So if you like, we're having a rolling strategic audit of these qualifications and we're keeping, until those, those underlying concerns and the complaints and the compliance numbers improve, we'll continue to monitor those qualifications uh, at every audit that we undertake if they're on scope. Uh, so we're watching those statistics and uh, keeping an eye on that. Uh, the other part of this recommendation was uh, an underlying concern was around um, whether distance and including online delivery was the right delivery mode in this particular for these particular qualifications. Um, as you can imagine, uh, online online learning is a broader issue, and it's obviously there's some issues, uh, and it can be seen as problematic for vocations where practical skills are required. So we see it as a bit more of a systemic issue. And we've got that in our, um, on our list of systemic issues to have a look at more broadly uh, in the future. So rather than doing that strategic audit, particular to childcare, we'll look at doing something more broadly around distance uh, and online learning for those practical skill sets in the future. OK, so the next recommendation, recommendation five, actually goes to the work of Skills IQ. So I'm going to uh, ask Mark to... Uh, give us an update on what Skills IQ are doing in relation to this one. Thanks, Bronwyn. So just to confirm um, who Skills IQ is, we're a relatively new organisation, only in existence since the start of the year. We've, um, we want to we're successful in a competitive uh, tender at the end of last year to operate as a skills service organisation. So we have remit of the community services um, training package and of course those qualifications within that including those uh, education and care qualifications. So we've been issued with an activity order from the Australian Industry and Skills Committee, the AISC, uh, to consult with the sector on the ASQA recommendations and all 10 of them, not just the ones that relate to uh, uh, specifically training packages. So to do that, um, we've developed a discussion paper which has been released this week uh, via our website. Um, so we'd encourage everyone to hop onto our website and, and look at that and provide feedback um, around the 10 recommendations. Two of them obviously relate to training package work, this one in particular, the recommendation five. Uh, recommendation five relates to, I suppose, refinement in language used in the training package. And so we've looked at the training package as it currently exists and tried to identify where we can, where there's areas really of where we could potentially further refine some of the language to ensure that it's clear and, and not open to interpretation to improve quality and consistency of, in, of interpreting the, the training package. So in the discussion paper, we've identified some areas uh, for that. And um, part of the, the activity order that we've been issued with is to develop a business case and a business case um, sets out the evidentiary ca case for change um, should there be a requirement for training package work. So we'd be seeking the sector's views on those areas that we've identified in the discussion paper um, to see if the training package does need to be reviewed or updated and how that would come about. So um, the discussion paper is really the vehicle for us to put something to the Australian Industry and Skills Committee um, to undertake potentially some training package development and review work. So, um, like I said, we have identified some areas in that discussion paper, so I'd encourage all our stakeholders to go on and have a look at, at what we've identified and provide your feedback around that to see if there should be some review work taken um, on board or undertaken. But I'll go into a bit more further detail in Recommendation 7. So, back to you, Bronwyn. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, Okay, so the next recommendation um, goes to uh, the need for RTOs to strengthen their engagement with industry employers to ensure st that structured workplace learning and assessment is embedded in course delivery. Um, obviously, this is we we understand. I think uh, Skills IQ and ASQA certainly understand that this can be challenging for RTOs to actually engage with 
is industry employers, and it's obviously something that um, that we took up when we had the opportunity to talk to the major employer groups with the CEQA forum about the need for industry and employers to come to the party, if you like, to support RTOs in um, in being able to deliver the structured workplace learning and assessment. And it was in their own obvious interest to, to do that uh, in the sense of getting better qualified staff in the long run. So uh, we recognise there can be some barriers to that, but um, and we're certainly trying uh, as best we can to talk to the employers about that. Um, it's important to note that during the review and the audit process in particular, we did find some really good uh, examples of best practice in this area. Uh, and we commend the RTOs that have really gone outside, thought outside the box, if you like, and have really put some um, work into making sure their workplace assessments, uh, the work placements, sorry, uh, are as best they can be. So some of the best practice was really strong relationships with RTOs and consulting employers on how they've designed their programs and how they're delivering their training and assessment. Uh, there was some examples of really excellent documentation in place for all parties, um, including information on the roles and responsibility, the frequency uh, and length of workplace visits for pastoral care and assessment. And that was certainly an issue that the employers uh, brought up in the CEQA forum was the need to make sure that the RTOs are very structured in what they're expecting of the employers and have real clarity around the roles and responsibilities in those work, work placements. Um, there was also some great examples of RTOs who were um, very uh, diligent in taking capacity checks on workplaces to ensure that learners were getting access to a range of contexts and making sure that learners were being moved on to um, another placement so they could access a different range of contexts in those work placements. So there was some good, pra good practice out there and we um, commend those RTOs, but we think it would be great to see some of, those, that, some of that best practice um, replicated more broadly across the sector. As I said, we continue to raise this through the CEQA forum with employers and uh, we'll certainly use any opportunity we can to talk to employers about the need to support RTOs in this. The next recommendation is recommendation seven and this one goes to Mark, so I'll invite Mark to talk to the implementation on this one. Thanks. So recommendation seven uh, relates to the assessment requirements um, and really relates to the performance evidence and some of the assessment conditions. In the last review of the training package, um, there, or these qualifications in particular, there was some work done around this, such as um, stipulating this appropriate number of hours for qualifications um, and potentially and some areas of uh, repeated demonstration. And so we've inserted some numbers into those uh, units of competency. However, um, this recommendation looks at further refining some of that and I suppose gathering some information from the sector around implementation and how we could further develop the training package. So again, this is a, um, something that's looked at within the discussion paper that we have developed and I'd encourage everyone to go onto that discussion paper and provide their advice um, around some of these issues potentially that you're experiencing and how we could further refine some of the um, assessment, assessment requirements within the training package. Once we collate all the feedback from the discussion paper, uh, the discussion paper is open until the 28th of October, so um, we'd ask if you could submit your feedback by then. Um, we work under the direction of an industry reference committee. The industry reference committee for these qualifications is the children's education and care, and that's made up of a, a variety of uh, key industry players within the sector, and they inform the work that we do. So, once we collate all the, all the feedback from the discussion paper, we've also got two additional surveys, one for educators and one for employers. Um, we'd collate that to develop the business case, which would be submitted to the Australian Industry and Skills Committee. So, like I said earlier, the business case would look at all 10 recommendations, but these two in particular, um, if there was a, a need for change, then in the business case we would set out that evidentiary case for change um, to be considered by the Australian Industry and Skills Committee. The AISC would consider our business case and should they see fit that uh, some review work would need to be undertaken, they'd then issue another activity order to us to undertake um, some training package development and review work. So that would involve going out um, to the sector more broadly 
and consulting on the specifics of the units of competency and qualifications and, and what changes um, would need to be undertaken as part of that. So that would go through the same process, I suppose, as people might be familiar with, in that we'd um, consult and we'd develop multiple drafts that would um, be used for consultation purposes uh, within the sector. So like I said, that, that discussion paper and those surveys are available on the Skills IQ website. So it's www.skillsiq.com.au until the end of this month. Um, so I'd encourage educators, employers, RTOs, everybody involved in the sector to go on and provide your feedback because um, the more feedback and comment that we get, the richer source of information that we can um, put to the AISC for consideration. So thanks, Bronwyn. Great. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. That's, um, that's great to have that process set out for everyone out there in terms of how you can get involved. And I would, and I would um, echo Mark's views and encourage you to hop online and um, get involved in that process. And uh, it's important that RTO's um, practical knowledge of how these things work on the ground is fed back into that, um, into that process. Okay, so the next recommendation is recommendation eight. And again, it's, it's a, a broader systemic issue, but it came up through the, um, through the uh, uh, strategic review into early childhood and education and care. Uh, so this recommendation goes to the quality of the certificate for in training and assessment, which everyone would know is common across all sectors in the training, uh, in the training area. Uh, and what we were seeking, what we recommended through our review was that the assessment related units of competency emphasise the analysis and interpretation of competencies and that consideration be given to the development of qualifications in VET assessment that could be introduced to supplement the current assessment capabilities of the many assessors who currently hold the TAE certificate for in training and assessment or any other qualification considered to be equivalent. So that's a mouthful, but goes to the quality of the TAE um, qualification. And then uh, it was, the recommendation also went to um, recommending that RTOs develop training materials for a revised uh, certificate for and training and assessment. When they do that, they should strengthen the learning and formative assessment activities related to the analysis and interpretation of competencies in order to enhance the skills and knowledge of assessors in this area. Um, so this, as I said, is a systemic issue um, for ASQA that we've identified concerns right across uh, the training uh, market in relation to this one. So I'm pleased to say in relation to this recommendation, it was influential in the sense that it did, uh, it did go into the thinking and uh, the, a new certificate for and training and assessment was released on the 1st of April 2016 and that new qualification introduced higher standards for trainers and assessors, so we're very happy with that. Um, the inclusion of the unit um, related to development of assessment tools, aim, and it aims to ensure that trainers and assessors have a greater depth of knowledge about how to develop good assessment tools. So that's, that's really pleasing from where ASQA sits. So that's great to have it in the architecture, but now we come to um, making sure that the providers who seek to have the new qualification on, put on their scope are actually high quality providers. So in response, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, we ASQA treats two types of risk. We treat the provider risk and we treat systemic risk. And obviously treating systemic risk, we can only treat so many systemic risks at one time, but we've um, identified this particular risk as one that we're treating in our ASQA regulatory strategy for 2016 and 2017. And so what we've done in relation to um, uh, putting in, we put a new process in, if you like, for those RTOs seeking to have the new uh, certificate for and training and assessment put on their scope. So we've got a, pro a dedicated project team and we're reviewing every TAE application individually. And, it, and the, the team's role is to ensure that only quality providers are approved to place the new TAE qualifications on their scope of registration. And the process we're using to do that is um, uh, applicants are required to have um, stronger evidence uh, to support their applications. There's a heightened level of scrutiny for uh, providers who've been identified as providers of concern. Um, so we obviously look at um, compliance history, complaints and other data that we hold to work out who's a provider of concern. Where providers of concern are coming forward, we uh, can do desk audits of their, uh, for their application. Uh, and so that's all 
uh, rolling out this year. And that is, I know that will be causing some time delay for people to get the new coal onto their scope. But as I said, ASCA regards this as a, a, as a bedrock, if you like, to the quality across the sector. And we think that response is proportionate to the risk that um, of poor providers having that qualification on scope and the impact that can have more broadly on the sector. So that's a, that's a lot of work that's happening around that recommendation at the moment. As I said, it was quite influential. We got the new qualification. We're very pleased to see that recommendation reflected in that. And now we're doing the hard work about making sure when it rolls out that we keep, that we keep a strong uh, control over how that rolls out into the sector. Okay, so, oops, the re next recommendation is recommendation nine. Um, and it's a recommendation to ask where, that we continue to focus on assessment and the implementation of validation strategies in our regulatory work and continue to monitor the effectiveness of the strength and validation of requirements. Um, we do that, our regulatory operations uh, team do that as a matter of course, and that continues to be a focus for ASQA. Also, uh, it's pleasing to note that the standards released in 2015, uh, Clause 1.9 requires the RTOs to implement a plan for ongoing systemic uh, validation, systematic, sorry, validation of assessment practices and judgments for each training product on their scope of registration. Okay, uh, so the last recommendation uh, goes to RTOs and it goes to the issue of professional development. We, we've recommended that RTOs really focus on um, enhancing their ongoing professional development by providing advice on relevant professional development for trainers and assessors and investigating more systematic models that will assist trainers and assessors to demonstrate compliance. So again, this is a broader issue than just the um, early, uh, early education and child childcare sector, it's more systemic across the sector. Um, we did, uh, again, it's important to note when we we're out doing the review and the audits, we did find some uh, examples of good practice out there. We did find RTOs who were using um, logs and professional development plans that were reviewed on an annual basis. And we did find um, uh, some enterprise, an enterprise RTO that was really um, making sure that their trainers and assessors were uh, working within their sector to maintain their vocational currency. Now, that, that type of practice, we'd like to see more of it. Um, it's uh, an issue more broadly, as I've said. ASK was recognised that. We've got on our website a fact sheet to try and assist RTOs to um, address the professional development needs of their trainers and assessors. And in the user's guide, which ASK were published when the new standards came into force um, at the beginning of 2015, there's a relevant case study on page 36 of the user's guide. So another shout out for ASQA resources. Hop onto our website and have a look at the user's guide if you haven't had a look at that. It's really a very practical um, document that uh, supports RTOs to move to the new standard. So I'd really recommend that to you if you haven't had a chance to have a look at it. Obviously, um, professional development uh, is, is really important uh, for the quality of training and assessment and also for... Um, retaining your, um, good, your good staff. So we really can't recommend highly enough that uh, RTOs take those recommendations around enhancing their professional development um, seriously. So um, that's the 10 recommendations. That's the going through. And I hope that gives you some confidence out there that um, uh, these reviews do actually make a difference. Um, they do raise important issues. We do actually take them seriously. They don't gather dust on bureaucrats' um, bookshelves. They are actually, mine's very well thumbed, and uh, they're actually a living document where we're out there um, trying to get those recommendations implemented. And in, this, in relation to this particular review, we've had really good success, I think, uh, in engaging with our broader stakeholders to make sure that the re recommendations have been taken up as broadly as possible. So I really commend them, the review to you and the work that we're doing in trying to um, uh, implement those. In terms of um, where to from here, well, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the Cert 3 and the diploma remain products of concern for ASQA, so we continue to audit them. So if you're out there um, as a provider, you've got them on your scope, obviously, then when we're around for audit, we'll be putting those qualifications onto the scope of the audit. Uh, in every case to make sure we keep an eye on what's happening with these qualifications. 
We're continuing to engage with um, uh, early childhood education and care providers about the quality of training and their experience of uh, training graduates in their workplaces. And um, we continue to uh, and do that formally through a CEQA and the other industry stakeholders. We're having another meeting with a CEQA before the end of the year to come back and talk to that group again. And we'll continue to raise some of those broader issues that we've talked about today in terms of the role of employers in, um, in making sure that students can get access to work placements. Um, obviously, Mark's talked us through the process that Skills IQ have put in place to respond to the recommendations, and I can't um, urge you strongly enough to get involved in that and to, to feed into that process the practical experience we know that um, providers out there have and make sure that your views are heard through that process. So that's, um, you'll be pleased to know, the end of our formal talking heads section. Uh, we've got time for some questions. So we're going to take some questions now um, and uh, do our best to answer them. If we can't answer them, we'll certainly be um, uh, taking them on notice and putting a response up later. But let's see how challenging you can make those questions for us today. OK, so... Oh, let me just... Questions. Okay, so the first question um, has come through from Amber. And Amber is asking, how did the strategic review uh, incorporate um, uh, and cover uh, regional and remote, remote training um, that happens out there? And I'm pleased to let Amber know that when we did the methodology for the review, we were very aware of the, um, the differences and the challenges that, uh, that, tr that training providers delivering in remote and rural circumstances can, can focus, uh, can face. And so we deliberately made sure that we, the survey went to uh, all providers, so uh, regional and remote had a chance. And when we structured the 30 strategic reviews that we did for, um, specifically for childcare, we made sure that we I uh, did some rural and remote, and I think Andrea can speak from personal experience in doing some of those audits that she got out far and wide. And we also had um, a good smattering of online providers as well to test some of the issues that were happening with that delivery mode. So, Amber, I think um, you, you will find that the review does, um, does have input from rural and remote provide, training providers. OK, the next question um, has come in. Uh, a couple of people have asked about this one, Jennifer and Kylie, um, and it's addressed to Mark. It's about... Um, they're asking, are there any proposed changes to the current units of competency or qualifications or units that are currently being reviewed? Yeah, so this would depend on the feedback that we get from the discussion paper um, from the sector uh, identifying any need for change within the training package. Um, once all that information is collated, uh, that would be put to the Australian Industry Skills Committee as a recommendation, potentially for change. Um, if there is change and that recommendation is accepted, then we would go out and consult with the sector about the changes, more the, the more detailed changes that would be required to be made to the training package. So. There's no work being done in terms of reviewing or changing anything at the moment, but that will depend on the outcome of the business case that we submit to the AISC. Thanks, Mark. Um, that's great. Uh, OK, so the next question has come in from Annette, and she's asking a broad question, so I'll take that one, Annette. And she's asking, are there any consequences for RTOs if the recommendations are not implemented, and uh, if there are, what would they be? So there's no... Um, uh, as you can see, the recommendations are framed quite broadly. There's a couple that do go directly to the practices of RTOs. Uh, and so we encourage RTOs to have a look at those recommendations and uh, think about their own practices in the context of the recommendations and the issues that are raised. Are there consequences? Well, there were... If I go back to the narrow, in terms of the 77 audits that we undertook, um, by the end of the process, and RTOs would know that RTO that providers are given a number of opportunities to rectify non-compliances through uh, the audit process and then through more formal um, regulatory notices, if you like. By the end of the process, right to the end of the process, uh, there were about eight out of the 77 who hadn't been able to demonstrate compliance. Uh, one of, uh, and so there was a number of uh, regulatory sanctions taken, a number of RTOs had qualifications removed from their scope 
some RTOs actually withdrew the qualifications from their scope or withdrew their registration. Uh, a number of RTOs uh, took uh, the ASQA decision through to the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal. And the last one of that just um, wound up in May. So you can see how long sometimes those processes uh, can take. And the ASQA decision to cancel that provider's registration was upheld at the tribunal. So uh, there was a long road to get to the end of those audits. We're finally at the end of that audit process. And uh, so there were some consequences for providers who weren't able to demonstrate compliance, but they obviously were in the minority um, of the 77. Um, uh, more broadly, however, uh, there's not so much consequences, but um, really what the strategic review, its findings and its recommendations do for you out there if you're delivering these qualifications, it uh, gives you an indication of the issues that have been found in audits. Uh, so if you're going to be audited, you can You've got a bit of a heads up of the type of issues that have come up, what ASK was looking for in the audit and some of those issues. So I think it's um, not so much consequences, it's actually a positive in the sense that it's going out there, talking to the sector, saying these are the issues we need you to think about, we need you to address and by extension the issues that ASK will be looking at when it comes out to uh, audit and as I've said, uh, where you have these qualifications on your scope if you're being audited for any other reason, whether it be a renewal audit or uh, a, a compliance monitoring audit, we'll be putting these qualifications into the scope of that audit every time we're out there. So not consequences, but more of a, a friendly heads up of uh, ASQA's approach to this uh, regulating this sector. So thanks for the question, Annette. The next question comes in from uh, Fazluz, and it's directed at both Andrea and Mark. So I'll, I'll get Andrea to answer it first and throw over to Mark. Uh, uh, Fazuz has asked, could you please clarify if there are any differences in completing the work placement requirement in a family daycare setting versus a childcare centre? Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, it's, it's about more about uh, meeting the requirements of the individual unit as competencies, I would suggest. Um, a regulated environment is one of the critical areas, but also ensuring that other conditions and contexts are met, for example, a range of different children's, uh, a range of different families is also embedded in a number of the units of competency. So you'd have to look more closely at whether the family daycare, assuming it's regulated, and the, um, the long daycare, the, the childcare centre, um, can, can support the range of contexts that's required for the units of competency, rather than either or. Mark, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree, Andrea. Um, the, it is about meeting the specifications of the unit of competency and the, the, the qualification as a whole. Um, the family daycare service, I mean, it, it, the assessment of these units needs to be undertaken in a regulated service. Um, but then there are other units of competency, such as, and I'll use the, the Care for Babies unit, um, where the opportunity to assess someone in a regulated education and care service may not occur in that family daycare environment because they might not care for children, um, they might not care for babies, sorry, and so there might not be the opportunity for that person to be assessed appropriately in that, um, in that context. So I suppose it, it depends um, on the requirements of the, the qualification and applying that to that, that workplace and whether that workplace can, can meet those requirements of the units and qualification. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so the next question has come in from uh, Rachel. And it's, again, for Mark, it's, um, it's to do with the CHCDIV002. Uh, and Rachel is asking, this is not specifically related to the review as such, but in regards to the assessment conditions for that um, unit of competency, where an assessment must involve persons approved of the relevant local community elders, could you please let me know specifically how the Cert 3 and Diploma ECEC will be affected by those changes? Also, what is the expectation for the implementation of these changes by an RTO? Yep. So the, uh, this unit of competency is a core unit in uh, the Cert 3 and the Diploma. Through our consultations with industry, they saw this as, as a, a core requirement of the qual qualification. Um, the approved by, of the, uh, the requirement to have the approved um, relevant local Aboriginal elders is in the assessment conditions to ensure that the assessments are, are culturally safe and appropriate. 
So it's the, the assessment conditions is not requiring that uh, relevant Aboriginal um, elder to, to actually undertake the assessment, but it's to provide input into the development of your assessment practices um, to ensure that uh, your practices are culturally safe and appropriate because um, the, the, the term local is in there because different terminology, imagery um, has different ramifications and interpretations um, in different jurisdictions. So um, that's why we have that local requirement in there because interpretations uh, uh, do differ between Aboriginal communities. Thanks, Mark. That's, um, that's really helpful. Um, Next question has come in from Karen, and Karen is interested uh, in uh, one for Mark, and she's asking, how can I become a member of the Skills IQ Review Committee? Yep. So the Children's Education and Care uh, Committee is not a committee of um, Skills IQ. It's actually a committee of the Australian Industry and Skill and Industry, AISA, Australian Industry and Skills Committee. Um, so we don't manage the members that sit within that particular committee. Um, I would encourage you to log on to the AISC website because all industry reference committees within the VET sector, um, there's 73 of them in total, uh, are currently under review. And so there is the opportunity to go on and um, be part of that review process and potentially nominate yourself um, to be a member of that industry reference committee. So. Uh, the review process is at different stages for different industry reference committees. So that's why I said I'd encourage you to log on to the AISC website. There's a, there's a particular uh, link there that says IRC review, where you can uh, get some further information around the particular review of this IRC and, and get involved that way. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the next question has come in from um, Adeline. And Adeline is asking, uh, and I think this is one for you, Andrea, is there a recommended number of hours for trainers and assessors to be working slash volunteering at the childcare sec in at the childcare sector for them to maintain currency? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, no. Main um, obviously, the reference is to vocational currency. So um, it's about how the RTO demonstrates that their trainers and assessors assessors are vocationally current. Um, I think you need to ask yourself, how can I demonstrate that rather than what's the minimum number of hours? So I would say it's a slightly different slant on what we mean by that. So thinking about just minimum hours may not direct you to the thinking that it's about ongoing vocational currency. Thanks, Andrea. OK. Um, uh, OK. Uh, another one is for um, Mark or Andrea. Um, so again, this... We had some questions around this yesterday um, around family daycare uh, operations and how they compare, if you like, for training purposes, purposes to um, regulated childcare environments. Um, so uh, Mag Magda has asked if... Um, so I'll start with you, Andrea, and, and Mark might, might care to make a comment. If um, the family daycare centre... Uh, family daycare has babies in their care... Can students do work placements at the family daycare centre? So I suppose I think it's the same question as before about being a um, the the facility or the service that you're using is um, a regulated environment and it, it enables the scope of the competencies, the conditions, and the context to be met. Um, and if the answer is yes, then it's yes. So um, I think it's I think it's very similar to the last question that we had, Mark. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, it is looking at the requirements. I mean, the, the Care for Babies unit was used in as, as an example, um, but there are obviously other requirements mm. to, um, you know, you, uh, collaborate with different families and things. Um, so it's looking at the requirements and specifications of the unit and seeing if they can be all appropriately assessed within that context. So you need to look in a bit more detail on what that family daycare service can provide. OK, thanks. Thanks. Um Thanks, Mark and Andrea, for that. The next one is coming in from uh, Karina, and it's a it's a broader question. So I think it's an, it's sort of an audit question. So I'm going to throw it over to Andrea. Uh, we consider that we deliver a high quality course to our childcare services. However, when it comes to justifying the volume of learning, we find it difficult to know what hours we can attribute to what part of the course: face to face time, homework, work placement, etc. What should we be taking into consideration with regards to this? 
RTOs would appreciate some more guidance around this requirement. Is ASPA going to give us some guidelines, not just tell us this course, what this course requires? Okay, so the volume of learning is an AQF term. Um, the standards actually use the term amount of training. And there is some guidance in the user's guide for um, that particular standard around what that might mean. And even if you look in the strategic review, it does talk about what was included in, in the estimates that we came to in the strategic review. So I think go first to the user's guide. And um, as a fallback, um, I personally like looking at the AQF as well, because it has a, but it has a different definition and a different dimension to the amount of training, which is what our standard says. Um, thanks, Andrea. If that's a, a good um, technical answer from an audit perspective, from a broader perspective uh, in terms of course duration and volume of learning, um, ASQA does recognise that this is a pretty fraught um, area uh, and we recognise that through our audit results that um, uh, we are consistently finding um, what we would call uh, unduly short training courses. Now, there might be some good reasons for that. Uh, quite often when we um, go to audit, though, RTOs are not able to provide a pedagogical rationale for the shortness of their courses. So we've identified it more broadly. Uh, as I said earlier, we're doing a specific um, strategic review on course duration. And I think your suggestion about uh, the idea that RTOs might actually need a bit of guidance on how to, to deal with this issue is a really good one. And we recognise that sometimes RTOs are... Uh, are not compliant, not because they're not seeking to be compliant, but because it can be quite difficult to work out the requirements. So I think uh, that's a good suggestion about uh, ASQA giving some more advice to RTOs, and that might well be something that comes out of our next strategic review. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, the next one has come in from... Um, oops. Uh, the next one has come in from Christian, and it's one to Mark about RPL. So... Uh, Christians ask, Mark, when completing RPL, does the specific hours need to be completed? Uh, yes, yeah, so the hours, uh, I suppose, are just another piece of evidence um, required for to deem competence um, for that qualification. So as you would collect RPL evidence for all the other pieces um, of, of the unit of competency and the qualification, the requirement to show that the person has undertaken the, the required um, number of hours is also another piece of evidence. So yes, they would need to, to do that as part of RPL. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so the next question uh, we're gonna take is from um, uh, Linnea, and she asks uh, a broad question, but one for Mark. Will there be an aim for all RTOs um, to have consistency and quality in required knowledge and performance assessment? Um, so I, this, this question relates to the quality and um, the, the, the minimum benchmark, of course, for quality are the qualifications which, is, which have been set, the Cert 3 and the Diploma. Um, so we, of, of course, attain um, RTOs to attain that minimum benchmark um, and quality in consistency in interpreting the qualifications and them implementing that as well. So the qualifications really set out the minimum benchmark for quality um, for work within the sector. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, the next question uh, comes in from um, from Ben, and Ben Ben's got a general question, uh, and his concern is about students becoming disheartened after they do work placements, and, and some leaving the course due to on-the-job practices they observe. How can the students uh, report this, and how do they deal with it? Well, that's obviously that's um, disappointing to hear that when anyone has um, uh, you know an uh, and a less than satisfactory experience in a work placement. But in a way, I suppose that is replicating work placements because um, we can all have some disappointing experiences. The issue, the issue here, though, is for the, the student to take that matter up with the RTO that, and to seek to have a, a different work placement. Um, and then, obviously, if that, they're not being supported in that, they can come to ASQA. But um, uh, I suppose... That is an issue uh, more broadly that you'd be, as the RTO, seeking to um, uh, to also foster resilience in your students and um, helping them with strategies to deal with that. And if not possible to deal with it in the work placement, to move on to a different work placement. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. 
Yeah, uh, the the RTO um, should be working with the employer as well to improve the um, work placements in within the future. So um, before a, a student should go out on work placement, the RTO should be sitting down with the employer around the expectations of that student, um, some of the assessment practices that might be undertaken if the when the RTO would come out to to visit and as assess that student. Um, so there should be that two-way conversation between the RTO um, and the employer. So the students should be going back to the RTO and, and providing some of that feedback. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, the next question came in from uh, Karen. Uh, Karen's asked a number of questions, so thanks very much for your engagement, Karen. Uh, Karen's asked about, uh, I suppose, ASQA's, um, uh, ASQA, how ASQA trains its auditors. She's asked, has ASQA considered providing specialist training in children's services for auditors involved in auditing the children's services training package. My concern is auditors are making comments in relation to early childhood profession and practice, which is outside their scope of knowledge and expertise. Um, Karen, we, we don't have um, individual industry training for our auditors. Our auditors are, are experts in training and assessment, uh, not necessarily in the practice of uh, your right. So they're not necessarily experts in the professional practice but they're experts in the training uh, and assessment that RTOs undertake. So uh, there's a couple of things that ASQA does in this respect, though. Uh, every time we audit, after we do a round of audits, there are what we call a site, is, there is a site survey. So we go back out and we ask those RTOs that we've audited in the last quarter how they found that audit experience. So even, even those who might have not got a, uh, an audit outcome that they were happy with, uh, they tend to be fairly happy with the process that ASK was used, that it was fair and transparent, that the no appropriate notice was given, they were given time to prepare, they were given um, you know, reasons for non-compliance, they were given opportunities to rectify and provide additional information. So on a process point of view, we go back out and we talk to um, the RTOs that were audited in the last quarter. RTOs are free to give uh, negative uh, feedback and we do on occasion, it's not it's not common, but on occasion we do hear some concerns about statements auditors might have made and they're addressed uh, appropriately within ASQA. So I'm pretty confident that we have uh, good feedback loops in that respect, but if there were specific issues uh, that we, you were concerned about, ASQA would be very uh, keen to hear about any specific concerns that you have. But um, as I say, we are, we're pretty, um, pretty good at going out and testing um, how the audits have been conducted, making sure that... RTOs feel they've been dealt with fairly and appropriately and there, where we do get feedback through those surveys, we do actually address that in our, our future audit practice. So thanks for that uh, question, Karen. Okay, so the next question um, uh, that came in was uh, one from Janet and it's going to Mark. It's a question about the training package and it goes to... Uh, Janet's saying that they've noticed that CHCLEG001, which is work legally and ethically, are actually listed on Cert 3, on the Cert 3 and the diploma, both as core units. Uh, Janet's question is, is this unit meant to be taught in diploma qualification even if the student has already undertaken it in the Cert 3? So if the student's undertaken this, the same unit of competency in the Cert 3 and it's equivalent to the one listed in the diploma, um, you could undertake it, you could do a credit transfer for that. So a unit of competency, um, wherever it's packaged, units of competency don't have AQF levels, um, but if that, that uh, learner has completed that unit of competency and its equivalent is in a, a different qualification, you can give, uh, obviously, credit for that. So it'd be a credit transfer. I agree wholeheartedly. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> OK, um, so ASQA certainly wouldn't be um, imposing any different audit outcomes on that, on that requirement. And the next question came in from Sue, and Sue's asked a question of me. She's asked, is ASQA also looking at reviewing smaller RTOs as well? Um, so, Sue, I'm not sure of the context for your question on that, on that one, but I can certainly say that um, uh, ASQA's audit program doesn't really distinguish between the type of... Um, uh, provider. We don't distinguish between private and public providers. We don't distinguish between small, medium or large. We're out there auditing as um, on a risk basis. So we, we have moved to a risk-based auditing rather than audits being attached 
to applications as when we first started off we were more more of an application driven organization where if you asked for something you sought to have your registration renewed or you sought to add a, a qualification to your scope or uh, there was you know those sorts of application driven there was an audit triggered by an application over time we've tried to become more sophisticated in how we target our audit resources and our compliance resources more generally and we try now to target them to um, providers of concern and we identify providers of concern or risk uh, providers of risk as well so you can be a, um, you can be seen as a, a high risk provider not because you've been a poor quality provider but because of the nature of your delivery you might be delivering higher risk type of uh, qualifications and so that goes into the mix about how we determine how to deploy our um, regulatory resources. So we look at um, numbers of complaints. So if you've had high numbers of complaints, if you've had a poor compliance history uh, in the past, then you, you will expect to have more audit activity triggered around um, you going forward. So the issue is not about smallness or largeness. The issue is about what kind of risk does your organisation present and ASCO tries to target its um, resources proportionally uh, to that risk and I think that most people would agree that's a much more sensible um, approach for a regular regulator to take to try to make sure that it, they're looking at providers and areas and sectors of risk rather than being driven by an application type of um, uh, trigger for their audit work. So that's that's a broad potted summary of where ASC is going with its how it targets its risk um, and targets its audit resources, and it's not about smallness. But thanks for the question. Um, okay, the next question is uh, coming in from uh, Adrian, uh, and Adrian is asking about the 240 hours uh, work placement. So she's asking Mark, uh, 240 hours is required in work placement. Uh, however, when you look at the units of competency, they stipulate more than these hours. Can Skills IQ clarify this or explain uh, best practice on this? So I'll, I'll ask Mark to address it first and then Andrea might care to make a comment about how ASQA deals with it as well. So thanks, Mark. Yep. So the standards for training packages, if we look at the standards and, and how we write units of competency and qualifications in line with those standards, for the work placement component to be an auditable component, uh, we need to have it in a, a unit of competency and, and how it's been written. Uh, we don't have the opportunity to put those hours at a qualification level to make them an auditable, auditable component. So the intent is um, that you don't add up the number of hours within that qualification because there might be multiple units of competency uh, with hours in them. It's, I suppose, the, the, the largest number of hours within that qualification needs to be undertaken. Some, some further information around this is in the implementation guide for the Community Services Training Package. Um, which can be accessed via the Skills IQ website, and that provides some detail about how you interpret um, the number of hours within a qualification. And yes, that's that's so. Thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> we, auditors would make sure that the minimum number of hours were met, um, and it really you, RTOs can do far more than that if they wish. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Mark. Um, yesterday we had a number of questions come in about um, a specific um, uh, unit of competency that goes to um, uh, Indigenous issues. So it was the um, uh, CHCDIV002. And so Mark's already answered a question on that. We had some other follow-up questions yesterday about uh, how RTOs can can do that where there could be disputes between uh, different points of view expressed by elders and how they could reconcile that and also issues about how they can contact elders. The other, we've had a new one come in today, so I think I'll, I'm going to throw it over to Mark and he can maybe make some general statements about those earlier questions as well as take this one on board. Um, so Magna's asking, um, uh, f regarding the unit, what I've just described, which is, um, if you want to use the lay people's terms, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural safety, is there any special professional development for trainer assessor uh, with certain elders to enhance our knowledge and skills on this unit? Um, there's not specifically something that Skills IQ uh, is undertaking in that area. 
uh, but I mean as an RTO you could potentially offer um, some professional development uh, to, to the sector. Um, in terms of the unit of competency, there are peak bodies, uh, peak associations within the different jurisdictions that you could potentially contact um, to provide, for them to provide you with some contacts within that uh, jurisdiction to assist you with your, um, with them looking at your assessment practices. So I'd encourage you to do that if you are having difficulties um, in, in sourcing some local Aboriginal community elders. I suppose this unit um, was, was deemed as essential by industry to, ha to have something in there to ensure a, um, cultural safety and the cultural appropriateness of the, um, the, 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 what the RTO was using in their um, training and assessment practices. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd try and, I'd, if there is some, some areas of, of dispute, then I would go to those peak associations to try and um, get some further information around that. Uh, thanks, Mark. And I, I also know um, in terms of contacting um, appropriate Indigenous representatives, there's usually state government resources that you should be able to get online about going into uh, particular Indigenous communities and who you should talk to uh, as representatives. So uh, there are, uh, I think it's a, it can be a challenging area, mm. but um, I think there's some um, resources out there and you might want to try state government contacts or even local council uh, contacts in certain communities might be helpful. Thanks for that question. Um, okay, so the next uh, question is a, is a um, more general one, which I think is, is good to answer because it, it's probably of interest uh, to other people out there. It's one for Mark, and it's um, come in from Ben. Ben's asking, we have found that industry are constantly talking to students about completing their Cert 3 ECEC as a waste of time due to, dis due to the discussion of the Cert 3 being removed. Is there any timeline of it being removed as a qualification? Um, this is something that's come up multiple times and I'm not sure where this has come from, um, but it seems to be a rumour in the in the sector that the Cert 3 Early Childhood Education and Care qualification is, is being removed or deleted. Um, in a recent industry reference committee meeting, um, we discussed this and the there is no indication, there is no, I suppose, it's not something that's in the pipeline for the qualification to be removed. So uh, I think it, what it may be coming from is the um, ASEQA requirements were for Im improved ratios of, of people with higher qualifications. Um, and so there, there's some discussion around potentially the, the removal of the Cert 3, but it, it's something that is a rumour um, and I, I believe is incorrect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Mark. And I think it's um, pretty unlikely that um a Commonwealth Government would seek to remove that requirement but um, and there's certainly nothing that ASK was aware of in relation to, to that being removed as a requirement. Um, uh, okay, so the next the next question is a bit of a challenging one, so I'm going to see if we if Andrea can answer it. It's to do with uh, credit transfer. Uh, Andrea Joannes asked, um, we have completed training and assessment for an older unit and this unit is not equivalent as per the training package to the new unit being used. However, we have mapped the new unit to the assessment we used for the old unit and it covers the new unit requirements. Can this be a credit transfer? Um, well, it can't be a credit transfer because it's quite clear in the training package that it's not equivalent. So you, it has to be um, either an RPL or um, an, an assessment. Well, they're both assessments, but an assessment. So in terms of your question, no, it can't be a credit transfer. Um, given the fact that the, the two units are deemed not equivalent. Okay, thanks, um, thanks Andrea. We have um, another question uh, that came in from Shivali, and Shivali had asked um, both of myself and Mark about childcare centres refusing to take students on board because of the number of students looking for placements. What do you recommend we do in this case? Um, Mark, do you want to have a go at it first? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I suppose the requirement to, to have the 120 hours in there is, is a push from industry about the quality of outcomes um, previously when the, the hours weren't in there um, around what the, the outcome of the learner after completing the qualification. And so they may have never stepped foot within an early childhood education and care service. And so to put a minimum requirement so they had that application of skills and knowledge within the the qualification was set at 120 hours and I can tell you 
Um, some of the consultations at the time, there were suggestions that 120 hours just simply wouldn't be enough. That would, it should be up to you know, 400 hours, but I suppose the, the 120 was the minimum benchmark. You can also always go over the top of that. Um, finding placements is, is an issue that continually comes up, um, but it's something that I think needs to be, as an RTO, you need to work with your um, local industry um, to try and source as many placements as you can. I mean, it's something that we do discuss with the industry reference committees and they feel quite strongly that there should be some application um, of skills and knowledge in the workplace in the qualification. Um, but yeah, it is an ongoing discussion about sourcing, sourcing work placements. And I suppose it's not just in, within this sector, it, it's more broadly within some of the qualifications that do require work placement. Um, about sourcing, sourcing work placement and the requirement for industry, I suppose, to, to come on board and, and offer some, some work placements. Thanks, Mark. Um, and certainly, as I said earlier, we, we recognise, we heard the feedback from RTOs through the review about some of the difficulties, difficulties they can have in sourcing uh, work placements. We've raised that with the CEQA uh, and uh, with the employer for, forum that we pulled together. We'll certainly raise it again. Um, the feedback that we had, uh, if you like, from the employers through that session was uh, sometimes the, um, the RTOs cannot be uh, not very clear about what they're expecting. There can be not a lot of um, documentation and clarity around the role of the employer in the workplace setting. So I think um, uh, reaching out and trying to establish some of those longer term relationships between the RTOs and the employers and having some ground rules firmly established might hold you in good steed, steed to help you get those work placements. But we recognise that, as Mark has alluded to, if industry wants, um, you know, that wants the, train, the training to employ to occur in the work settings, then they have to come to the party and, and help facilitate that. So uh, I think there's some more work to be done around this area and we'll certainly continue to take it up. But again, Mark's, um, Mark's review process in the discussion paper is an opportunity to feed back some of those issues that you're striking on the ground and so that the Skills IQ can take it up as well through that process. So again, I'd really encourage you where there are practical difficulties in, in meeting some of the requirements, feed that back through the process that you've got open to you at, at the moment and, and that will allow uh, the people uh, who are making those decisions or forming those relationships at the top to actually strengthen the, that from, from happening, hopefully flowing down to impacting on a, in a positive way on, on your uh, delivery. So I think that's just about the end of the questions. There might be one more and I'm just going to check my iPad so bear with me while I manage to do that. Um, oh, we did have one which is probably worthwhile um, uh, taking on board. Um, Mark, this one came through from Renee and she's asking, will the package change in the future for the Certificate 3 to be completed as a prerequisite uh, before students can undertake the diploma. So is there any thinking around that? Uh, this again is something that's come up um, recently since the removal of the Cert 3 as an entry requirement into the diploma. I suppose there's some mixed views um, around whether the entry requirement should be added or whether it shouldn't be. So if we do um, undertake some training package development and review work coming out of the business case that we submit, that'll be something that we'd look at um, and consult with industry to determine whether, you know, what the requirement around that should be, whether it should remain as is or potentially go back to a, an entry requirement. Um, but that'll be something that's determined uh, by industry and the, and the sector. Um, and so we, we'd need to consult more broadly on that, but it is something that, that we would probably look at as part of the, any review. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, there's a couple more technical questions, but I think we'll take them uh, offline and provide an answer on our website. So if you didn't have your question answered today at all, uh, it's because it probably needs a bit of technical thinking and we'd like to give a considered answer to some of those additional questions that we've received. We've tried to take all the questions, especially the broader ones and especially the ones where there was some uh, misunderstanding or some misinformation or some rumours underneath them so we could, you know, give you from straight from the horse's mouth, if you like, what is the official position in relation to some of those broader issues. So that's been great. It's been great to have all those questions come in. I think that makes it a much better session. Uh, mm -hmm. It puts us on the spot, sitting in the, on the panel and put our thinking caps on to answer them, but you've challenged us with some really um, informed questions today and we really appreciate your um, coming forward with those questions to make it more interactive and actually respond to the issues that you're thinking about out there. 
So on behalf of the panel today, Andrea and uh, Mark, can I thank them both for joining uh, with uh, ASQA uh, to deliver the webinar today and um, uh, bringing their the considerable technical knowledge both from the skills engagement side and the, the audit side uh, into this session today. I hope this has been informative. I hope you found it um, interesting at home. Certainly there's a lot going on in the vet sector. It's great to have an opportunity to come out and hear what's happening in your particular sector and what some of the issues mean for you on the ground. So again, thanks for your participation. Thanks for taking the time to log in today and thank you so much for your questions. I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Goodbye.